We're very glad to have Madeline Brent from Brown University, who's going to tell us about top weight cohomology of AG. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. I'll go ahead and um, share my screen. All right, hopefully that is visible to everyone. Um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation to come and speak. I'm really excited to um, share this topic with you all because it's um, I think it's pretty cool. Um, this was a joint work with Juliet Bruce, Melody Chan, Margarita Mello, Gwyneth Moreland, and Corey Wolf. And it was started at the ISERM Women in AG um, conference of summer of 2020 which was um, just a really awesome thing. Um, there were a bunch of different groups working on projects for a full week and it was all virtual, but um, I think it was very successful nonetheless. Um, so, so yeah, that's what I'm going to be talking about. So let me go ahead and get started. Um, so throughout the talk, I'm gonna let AG be the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. Um, and the, the details of abelian varieties are not really going to um, come up in any meaningful way. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time like introducing this or saying what it is, but um, you can just think of these as algebraic varieties that have a natural choice of a group structure. And um, an example in dimension one is elliptic curves. Okay, so um, the goal of our project was to study the rational cohomology of this space AG. And uh, what we wanted to do was um, use tropical methods. So what we're gonna do is um, convert this question about wanting to know more about the rational cohomology of AG into something that's more um, combinatorial and computational. And we'll do some combinatorics and then translate those results back to um, algebraic geometry. So um, just to uh, sort of set the stage, these are some of the previous um, results on what was known on the rational cohomology of AG. So in, um, in 62, Igusa computes um, the rational cohomology of A2. And um, Hain does the computation for uh, A3 in 2002. And then, um, so this uh, looks kind of funny, but this is the thing that we're going to be interested in, the, the so-called top weight cohomology. Um, and this top weight cohomology is compute, can be deduced um, from work of Hulak and Tomasi. Um, so, so this is what uh, we're going to be inter interested in, this um, GER. Uh, uh, cohomology. So our main theorem, what does this um, do? So our main theorem gives the top weight cohomology of AG for um, G in the range five to seven. And then throughout the talk, um, I'll compute the top weight cohomology of A2 as an example. So in the talk, you'll see sort of um, the path to doing this in for G equals two. And then our main theorem um, does the computation for uh, five, six, and seven. Okay, so, so. So how do you want us to think about, so for people who haven't seen top weight cohomology, it's so you just think like old fashioned cohomology and it's part of it. So important part or how much. Yeah, so you, I'll, I'll say, I'll give more details um, later on about exactly what uh, top weight cohomology is. Um, but I guess the, the important thing is that for us, it's the part that can be accessed combinatorially. And so like, this is really just like the piece of the cohomology that you can um, get at using tropical geometry. But I'll say, I'll, I'll give like a, a definition later. Um, so, uh, okay, so what is our strategy going to be? So um, sort of as I was just indicating, um, this, the 
top weight cohomology, whatever that is. of AG can be computed from the homology of the tropicalization of AG. So, um, what we're going to do is uh, study the combinatorics of AG trop. And then from this, we'll be able to get information about um, the cohomology of AG. So, what I'm going to do in the talk is first um, sort of go into the details of this combinatorics of AG trop and talk about how um, we compute its homology. And then towards the end, I'll give um, like the, I'll give the definition of top weight cohomology and also like the comparison theorem that translates the combinatorics to algebraic geometry. And then at the very end, I'll give um, the full statement of our result. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna go into um, all of the, the details of this um, combinatorics. And um, it's not, uh, it's a little bit, um, it's pretty elementary, but it's also pretty um, detailed. So I'll try and um, be as clear as possible. And if there's any questions, um, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so um, we're gonna let, R to the G plus one choose two, um, denote the space of quadratic forms in R to the G. And we just identify these with G by G symmetric matrices. So as a warm up example, um, just so we're all on the same page, when G is equal to two, I'm gonna take the quadratic form Q given by the symmetric matrix one, one half, one half, one. And then um, how we view this as a quadratic form is it would be Q of X, Y is equal to X squared plus uh, X, Y plus Y squared. Um, okay, and I'm gonna use this example um, Q throughout. Um, so just some uh, notation. So I'm gonna be looking at this space um, omega G and a partial compactification of it called omega G RT. And omega G is going to be just the positive definite quadratic forms and then um, omega G RT is going to be um, not the full closure of omega G, but a partial, um, a partial closure, which is the positive semi-definite quadratic forms with kernel over Q. Um, okay, so these are both, um, I guess the important thing to think about um, at this stage is that these are both cones. So if I have um, a positive definite quadratic form and I scale it, then I um, stay inside of omega G. So when for, in our example, when G is two, um, then the dimension of this space um, is the ambient dimension is three. And so you're really looking at like something that looks like a cone in R3. Um, okay, and it's not a um, polyhedral cone. Um, so it's some kind of uh, other funny looking cone. 
Okay, and then we have an action of GLGZ on omega GRT that's given by um, the following. So if I have um, an H in GLGZ that acts on my quadratic form Q by H Q H transpose. Okay, so why, why do I care about this space? Um, so the space omega G R T mod um, the GLGZ action. This is actually um, A G trop. So there's a natural way to um, think about the elements of this space as um, like a tropical abelian variety. Um, and also if you take the space AG itself and tropicalize it, then you will get, um, you'll get this space. Um, so we are interested in the topology of omega GRT mod GLGZ. Okay, so we want to um, investigate this space. So um, I think the next step is a pretty natural one. So we have this um, strange kind of cone and we are interested in its topology. So what we want to do is break it down into a set of polyhedral cones. And since we are, um, doing this mod, the action of GLGZ, we want this, um, we want to break it down into a set of polyhedral cones in a way that interacts nicely with the GLGZ action. So we, this is just like a list of um, reasonable properties that I think if you sat down yourself, you would think that you want this thing to satisfy. So first of all, um, so if we let sigma be our set of cones, we want the set of cones to cover omega GRT. Then we also want that sigma is closed under intersections and taking faces. So if I have um, a polyhedral cone inside of this set sigma, I want all of the faces to also be inside of sigma. And then also if I have two polyhedral cones and I um, intersect them, I want that to also be a polyhedral cone in sigma. And um, I want also that sigma is closed under the GLGZ action. So if I have a cone sigma and then I act on it with um, an element of GLGZ, I'll get a different cone. And I want that to still be a cone in sigma. And then the last thing that I want is for sigma mod GLGZ, I want this to be um, finite. So if I come up with um, a decomposition of omega G R T into um, some cone sigma that satisfy this, then I'll call that an admissible decomposition. And um, there's actually a couple of known admissible decompositions of omega G R T, um, but we're going to be focusing on one called the perfect cone decomposition, just because it was um, advantageous to us uh, computationally because it has uh, fewer cones than some of the other decompositions. So, Maddie, can I ask a couple? Yeah. Uh, so, this thing that you, you that you're so you've got this, you created this space, which currently is, it's, you start off just as a topological space, I guess, uh, or uh, it's got, a, and then you are wanting its topology. And I was expecting something piecewise polyhedral because you're going to call it tropical, but you just want its topology, and uh, and so. Uh, but it sounds like there are many possible polyhedral structures. And as long as you get a hold of its topology in some nice way, that's all you really care about. Like there's no preferred, I mean, the reason you prefer structures, it makes your work easier, not because it's nature is preferring it. There's a bunch of, is that right? That, that AG, yeah. AG doesn't have a best trop, whatever tropical structure. I mean, like so the topological space is God given, but not the not the, the not the cone you got the, you got the yeah the, yeah exactly mm -hmm. okay. can, can i also just ask a quick question i 
maybe you said this and I, I, I came in a few minutes late, I'm sorry, but um, is there some way I should be thinking about how to connect this to just sort of order, ordinary abelian varieties? I mean, this was some tropical model, but how can I think about what these symmetric matrices are in terms of just complex abelian varieties, for example? Yeah, so um, I've sort of uh, eliminated as much as possible the tropical uh, picture from this talk, but you can actually think of these points as um, quote unquote tropical abelian varieties. Um, so a tropical abelian variety is like a real torus with, um, with a quadratic form attached to it. And so really I'm just looking at the information, the data of the quadratic form that comes with it. And then how do you connect it to like a you know, old fashioned abelian, like a, like a, I guess I can't, I, I want to say a real abelian variety, but I really need yeah, a complex abelian. How do you connect it? Yeah. So a, a tip of like a classical, um, complex abelian variety uh, with its principal polarization would tropicalize to one of these things. Great, thanks. All right, are there other, uh, other questions? Okay. Um, okay, so with that, um, I'm going to define the perfect cone decomposition, and I'll do the example when um, g is equal to 2. Um, okay, so just for the definition, so my I'm going to give you a procedure for producing cones in um, the perfect cone decomposition, and the, you need a piece of input data, and that input data is a positive definite quadratic form. So associated to a positive definite quadratic form Q, I'm going to compute um, the following thing called M of Q, which I think of as like the, the minimizer of set of Q. So these are going to be um, those vectors V in um, Z to the G, and then we'll take away the all zero vector such that Q of V is minimal. among all such possible values. So this will give you some finite collection of um, Vs. And, and we'll, we'll do an example. Um, and then from this, what I'm going to do is make um, a cone. And it's the cone with the following um, ray generators. So they're just going to be the V, v transpose. So these rank one um, quadratic forms ranging as as V ranges over these M of Qs. Okay, so each, I take my, my minimizing vectors and each one produces a rank one uh, quadratic form. And I use that, I use those as the rays of my cone. So then that gives me sigma of Q. And then this is the perfect cone decomposition. So if I look at all of the possible sigma of Qs, for Qs in omega G, then that gives me the um, perfect cone decomposition. And um, we'll, we'll compute a um, sigma of Q in just a second. Um, but the, I guess the theorem, which is due to Voronoi is that this set sigma GP is in fact an admissible decomposition. So it's obviously, I guess, a decomposition. And I don't know what admissible means, but maybe I don't care. Oh, it's just, it means that it satisfies these like oh. Oh. reasonable properties, yeah. So I think like the really nice thing is that once we mod out by GLGZ, then we'll just have finitely many um, things that we're keeping track of. Okay, so that's the, the theorem of Voronoi is that um, this actually, set of codes that I've just described. Yeah. Actually, a good question that I really should have realized myself as well. Jim had asked that you said you use G equals two as an example. And G equals yeah. one is like the better, like at first, can we try to follow it? So, are we going to go wrong trying to follow it with G equals one because it's just too like, um, confused? 
Yeah, I brought that up just because that's the one, you know, a cubic plane curve, at least I know what that is tropically. <laughs> So for G equals one, I just don't think, um, cause you're just looking at one by one matrices. So you're not gonna get really a decomposition of anything because it's just the whole space that you're looking at is just a ray. So it's gonna come with a single, okay. So it's a single, right? It's one ray. And then of course it's a, it's a that's a decomposition to itself. And that's- Yeah, the, yeah. Um, I think I think you'll you'll like the G equals two example. Um, okay, so here's our quadratic form Q from before. So uh, oh, and maybe I should keep the definition of M of Q visible. Um, can anyone tell me a vector that's in M of Q? So I'm looking for um, integers that I could put in for X and Y, where X and Y are both not zero, such that I get the minimum value over all such possible inputs. One and minus one? Yeah, so one option is one and minus one. Are they not both zero or can one be zero? Or? One can be zero. One, one does zero. not. Okay. So then yeah, not one zero. Okay, so one zero minus one zero zero. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so plus and minus uh, one zero, and it sounded like you were also going to say the one. Yeah, this. And I guess the negative of Jim's as well then. Yeah. Ah, uh, I need to put the plus in the bottom. Okay, there we go. Okay, and that's actually, that's all of them. So in this case, you just get um, six and these are the, the options. Okay, and then if you compute um, VV transpose for each of these, then you'll get the following um, three ray generators. So you get one, zero, 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 one, and one, minus one, minus one, one. Okay, so I've sort of drawn a cartoon here of what, um, we should zoom out a little bit, of what omega 2 RT looks like. So in the middle, um, so this is like from, is the picture clear? This is like a slice of the cone inside of R3. So this is like, you can picture this is like an ice cream cone or something, and I've just sliced off the top of it. So I have my three, um, ray generators that we just computed, and those sit in the boundary. Um, and then they together produce this cone sigma of Q. And it turns out that um, up to the action of GLG, or I guess G in this case is two, so GL2Z, this um, sigma of Q that we've just computed is the um, unique perfect cone so, of dimension three. So how do we get, so those, those matrices somehow give us a ray in three space. I don't see how to get a ray in three space out of one minus one minus one one, for example. Um, or am I misunderstanding? Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So we're viewing this, right. Um, so we're viewing this inside of um, R3 by just looking at, since they're symmetric matrices, we're just looking at the upper um, triangular entries. So yeah, so this would be like, you would convert this to- Just forget the lower left somehow. Yeah, one minus one and just order them somehow. And somehow the GL2Z action is that is like this famous Gauss action on quadratic form somehow. Uh, like you'll get other, like all, every other triangle you've drawn is some other quadratic form. And I yeah, know. yeah, exactly. So if you computed sigma of Q for any other Q, um, it would somehow be a, equivalent up to the GLGZ action to the one that we've already written down. Um, and 
Uh, furthermore, what about in the other dimension? So what about cones of dimension one and two? Um, in this case, you get the same thing. So up to GL to Z, you only have one cone of dimension two and one of dimension one. Okay, so just to kind of like recap, so the picture is clear, um, we have this like cone sitting inside of R3 that is um, not polyhedral, but we're interested in its topology. So we break it up into a bunch of polyhedral cones um, that respect the GLGZ action in a nice way. And um, so the, the pink I've drawn is sort of like how you could picture what the perfect cone decomposition looks like in this case. But then um, we act on these cones with GLGZ and a bunch of them get um, identified. And in the end, we're only left with um, one cone in dimension three, one cone in dimension two, and one cone in dimension one. Sorry, so uh, does, um, yeah. does the two-dimensional cone correspond to the square lattice? What is the square? Oh, sorry, the, well, I mean the quadratic form x squared plus y squared. Um, yeah, so yeah, so the cone of dimension two, you could really, you could take any of these, um, any, just if you picked any pair of the rays, then the cone span by them is a cone of dimension two. And so that's like a representative for what you're uh, looking at. But I think if you did, if you took these two, I think you would get the one that you just said, x squared plus y squared would be a yeah. point in all of this. That seems right. I mean, I'm just thinking that these are, of course, these are the only two dimensional lattices that have more than two shortest vectors. Okay, um, okay other questions? Okay, so now um, I'm going to define a chain complex to um, compute the homology that we're interested in. Okay, so this chain complex is going to be called um, and is going to be called PG. So I'm going to define a chain complex that computes the uh, the homology of AG trop, and this is like a little bit um, imprecise, and I'll say why in a second. So here's what the the statement is going to be. So the homology of this chain complex PG that um, I'm interested in is going to be equal to the reduced homology of the link of AG trop. So um, what is the link? It's just, if I look at this space, so obviously this is uh, a cone and even mod GLGZ, it will be um, contractible. So um, its topology is not very interesting, but what I'm actually interested in is the topology of the slice. Okay, so if I just intersect this cone with a with a plane and look at that space, that's going to have some interesting topology. And that's um, actually the thing that I'm interested in. Um, okay, so that's what we're what we're going to compute. Um, so in order to do this, I'm going to start by placing an orientation on the cones of sigma GP. And um, for the example, um, all this means, so in the example, all of the cones are simplicial. So this really just means put an ordering on the rays of the cone. So just pick an order. Um, okay, so then I'm going to say a cone is alternating if um, every element of GLGZ stabilizing the cone induces an orientation preserving map 
on Sigma. Okay, so let me just do an example really quick um, to make this clear. So we've been looking at this cone Sigma of Q where Q is this quadratic form shown. So let me consider the following um, element of GLGZ. So this is in GL2Z. And um, I'll spare you the computation, but uh, what happens when H acts on just, let's write in a generic matrix, is you get um, the two diagonals are flipped. So you'd have D, A, B, C. Okay, so what does H do to the rays of my cone? Um, okay, so if I act on this first cone by H, then I'm going to get, uh, sorry, if I act on this ray by H, then I'm going to get back um, this ray. And similarly, if I act on the second ray by H, I'm going to get back the first one. And then if I act on the third ray by H, then this will be stabilized. Okay, so in total, if I act on any point inside of this cone um, by this element H, it's going to stay within the cone. But when I look at how H has acted on the cone uh, in total, it actually reversed the orientation because it induced an odd permutation on the rays. Um, so maybe if I just, I'll just draw a picture sort of inside the slice. So my cone looks like a triangle. And what I've done is flipped, flipped the triangle over. So if I had oriented um, the triangle, it's too tiny. If I had oriented the triangle, then um, acting by H would reverse the orientation. Okay, so, so what has happened? So H stabilizes sigma of Q, but it reverses the orientation. Uh, so we can conclude that sigma of Q is not alternating. Because I, I exhibited an example of um, an element of GLGZ that stabilizes sigma but reverses the orientation. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, make my chain complex. So I'm gonna let gamma NG be a set of representatives. For the alternating elements of the perfect cone decomposition up to the action of GLGZ. Um, and I'm gonna make these of dimension N plus one. Okay, then um, now I'll make my, my chain complex. So the perfect chain complex PG is the, um, the rational chain complex where um, in degree n, I have a Q vector space um, with basis indexed by um, gamma ng. So just indexed by these representatives that I selected. And then I have to tell you what the differential is going to be. So if I apply the differential to a basis vector um, indexed by a cone sigma, then what I do is I sum over um, the facets sigma prime uh, and then I get the basis corresponding to um, the representative corresponding to sigma prime. And then I also get um, a coefficient of plus or minus one, just depending on, this is just uh, comes from the orientations.
Okay, so that is going to be um, the chain complex that uh, carries out this computation that we're really interested in. So let me do the example when G is equal to two and hopefully this will all um, become a little bit clearer. Okay, so when G is equal to two, um, we sort of already saw that up to GLGZ equivalence, we only have one cone of each dimension. And um, also previously in the examples, we saw that this cone is not alternating. So these are, these are all of our cones and now we just have to decide um, which ones are alternating and then uh, we'll make this chain complex out of this. So you'll recall that this one was not alternating because we had um, an odd permutation of the rays and the same thing is going to happen to this cone. So this will also not be alternating. Akumati, can you go back a page? Uh, did alternating come up in the complex so far or it's gonna come up later? Oh yeah, so, it's so yeah. Alternating, but it hasn't, um, it, you haven't, it hasn't yet, it's going to enter in that sign somehow, but it's not, okay, so it's not yet. So the, so the alternating, we're only taking the alternating cones um, we're only taking those into consideration in the chain complex. Somehow the rest are gonna be zero. Like somehow you'll do something and they'll get they'll cancel each other up. Yeah, so if I had the non-alternating ones, then um, if I had included those in the chain complex, then they would cancel each other out. And um, so we just don't consider them. So you're gonna save yourself time and then hence get a much simpler, have much better hope of getting all the problem being practical. I just, okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you can see in this case, if we, um, okay, I don't want to say, I don't, I don't want to say something that's wrong. So I'm just going to continue. Um, I say wrong things all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, Okay, yeah, so this one is just a ray. So any anything that stabilizes this cone is um, going to just fix the ray. And so that's going to be um, an orientation preserving map. So this one is alternating. And then we're gonna get the same thing for the cone of dimension zero. Okay, so let's make the chain complex. So in, Degree two, I have, um, so I'm gonna get um, a Q vector space with basis indexed by the alternating cones of dimension three. We only have one cone of dimension three and it's not alternating. So in total we have zero um, basis elements. So here we're just gonna get a zero. And um, in degree one, we would be looking at the cones of dimension two, but we also get, um, zero of those. And then in degree zero, we're looking at um, <clears throat> the alternating rays, which is all of them. And we just have one. So we get a Q here. And similarly, in degree minus one, we get um, a Q. And then what is the differential? So sigma one has sigma zero as a face um, exactly once. And so uh, we'll get um, we'll either get uh, that D zero is plus or minus one, just depending upon uh, how we picked the orientations. This is gonna be an isomorphism. So what we conclude from this is that P two has no homology. Okay, so now let me um, pivot back to algebraic geometry and say, um, how this gives us some information about AG. Okay, so this is all um, due to Deline. So for any uh, complex variety X, we have, um, so Deline constructs a canonical weight filtration on the cohomology. So this is just gonna be denoted W0 up to W2I which is the ith cohomology. And then um, we have the corresponding to this, we have the associated graded pieces, GRJW.
which are just um, by definition, these are the WJs mod WJ minus one. And those appear um, for J between D and 2D, where D is the dimension of the space X. And then, um, so the piece, this, so the maximum um, weight piece, GR2DW, is the uh, top weight. rational cohomology. So this is um, the thing that we're interested in computing. Um, so now I'll state a theorem that tells you um, how we're getting it from uh, the combinatorics that I've been explaining for the first uh, 40 minutes of the talk. So this top weight cohomology, GR2DW, and there's some funny indexing happening here, 2D minus I, AGQ. Okay, so this top weight cohomology, there's a, an isomorphism with um, the homology of the chain complex PG that um, was described before. So this is um, the sort of comparison theorem that allows us to translate the combinatorial um, computations and everything that we've been looking at to um, some information about the top weight cohomology of AG. And let me just um, give a little bit more details that might explain why there's even a relationship between these two things. So um, the perfect cone decomposition gives a toroidal compactification of called AG perf of AG. And any admissible decomposition, um, the combinatorics of that will give you a toroidal compactification of AG. And by construction, this compactification is stratified into locally closed subsets that biject to the cones of sigma GP. So this sort of indicates why um, the combinatorics that we've been looking at are somehow related to AG itself. Okay, and then this um, top weight cohomology is the part that is controlled by the combinatorics of those boundary strata. Um, yeah, and then I guess another um, comment about this uh, statement is that you, you can make a more um, general statement than um, saying this just for AG. So um, you could, in principle, do this for other spaces as well. Um, okay, so now let me, um, I'll state the, the main result. And this is um, deduced from computations of Elbaz, Vincent, Gangel, and Soule, um, where they're looking at a chain complex that's sort of similar to PG, and they have um, the computations of all these perfect cones, and they um, compute some things for a similar chain complex, and so we're able to take that and um, get the, the homology groups of the chain complexes PG in these ranges. So for um, so here's the the results for G equals five, six, and seven of the um, top weight cohomology of AG. And um, the last thing that I wanted to point out was that this answers a question of Grushevsky um, where he asked if, so does AG ever have non-zero odd cohomology? And um, so what we see is that in these um, red cases, we actually do have um, some non-zero odd cohomology. So, so just to confirm, we never before in history knew a single example of a non-zero odd cohomology class in AG. Yes, yeah. That's great. And then is, okay, and that's what the red, and the red is the odd. And, and is there, and those numbers, I mean, do the third is there some way in which the 33 and the 37 
kind of pair together in the 28 and 42. Uh, there are all sorts of numerology you could then hope to do when you discover when you have these actual. Uh, uh, I, I, so yeah, I don't know. I think that that's. I think it's possible, definitely. And, and how you have like a, you have a lot. Do you have a lot of good? Well, you have enough control to be able to actually compute these cohomology groups, but and you even have the. Uh, so you have even like in Gina seven, you have a fair bit of control. Like, like computationally, is this? I guess it must be nearly out of control, or you would have gone like it. It must go off the rails by eight, I guess. In terms, yeah. Of so I can. Um, I have a table somewhere because this is like super interesting. So <laughs> I guess the question is why stop at g equals seven? So here, this table is um, in the top row G and then in the second row, the number of top dimensional cones of the perfect cone decomposition. So, you know, it's, it's pretty manageable up to G equals seven, like in seven you have 33 top dimensional cones. Okay, then we get to eight and there's 10,000, which is like, a lot. I don't. And you also need the lower dimension, right? Your calculation, you, you need not just the top, you need all the cones. So you have 30. Yeah, you need all the cones. So there's going to be even more. So, so there's seven, it's 33 looks not too scary, but it's going to get quite scary. Yeah. Now. So this is like dramatic. And then in G equals nine, um, I don't even think they have a, they don't know the complete number of cones, but there's like a lower bound of 20 million cones. Yeah. So, but but, is, but with twenty seven you have sorry, with seven you there's even more right. You have a lot. You you didn't just get the numbers. You have this complex. Even yeah yeah, and you have to you know for each cone you have to decide if it's alternating or not. And so it's like it's pretty involved. Like ten thousand seems like something that you could maybe do with a computer, but I'm not. I don't even. I don't really feel like you could do it in like a human amount of time, at least the way that we were doing it. I guess I'm thinking more about seven where the, the advantage is if someone wants to do something using seven, that work the heart that work's been done. Like the alternating one you've already you already know you've already done all of those. And so if you yeah. want to do this, you can work with that complex to answer to uh, potentially have um cohomology with coefficients or other things that like you you so Okay, great. That's not quite a question. Yeah. Okay. So eight is out of control, but seven is in complete control. Yeah. Yeah, and that was, um, that's sort of, that's the end of my talk. So thanks for, um, for your attention.